Hi, I'm Ashley McElwain, licensed marriage and family therapist, and founder and CEO of Foundation Restoration. Welcome to Foundation Restoration's Real Talk podcast, where you'll find real people discussing real issues while offering real help at the intersection of clinical expertise and a biblical perspective. We're so glad you've joined us. Welcome back, friends, to the Real Talk Podcast. I sure am glad that you have joined us. I hope that you are having a wonderful day, whatever, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever time of day it is, wherever you are in this world of ours. I hope and pray that this podcast finds you in a great space. And if not, I hope that our time together helps you find a renewed sense of joy. Um, Again, thank you so much for joining us. We are going to be picking up with part two of Who Am I? Why Knowing Your Identity Matters. So a quick refresher, if you um, missed part one or if since it's been a couple weeks since we um, launched part one, if you'd like a quick refresher, kind of just going over the concept of discovering and understanding our identity, knowing that who I am and how we answer that question is so incredibly important. It informs everything that we do. It guides us. And in many ways, it's a compass that determines the things that we pursue and why we pursue them. And so I kind of talked through the need to um, discover our identity and really find one that doesn't waver and shift, which brought me to my second point, and that is why we need that is because our identity is the very first thing the enemy attacks. Um, And I walked you through Matthew chapters three and four, where Jesus was baptized. And the very, after he was baptized, the very first thing that God did was he declared an identity over Jesus. And he said, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He then went out into the desert to be tempted. And the very next thing that happened, um, and the very first thing that that Satan did was question, call into question Jesus' identity, if you are the son of God. So I was saying how Satan loves to get us to question our identity. So we take our eyes off of God, we go inward, and as we start looking inward, we are distracted. We are, we can become very prideful and self-righteous. Um, and as we take our eyes off of God and who he calls us, uh, who he says we are, Satan then is able to tempt us. And he's able to tempt us with something that seems very alluring because it's he's trying to give us a false sense of our identity. Um, and so that then segued into we got to realize that we are going to be attacked by the enemy and our identity. So we have to know what our identity is. And that third point was that we are children of God created, chosen, and loved. He created us and he chose us to be his sons and daughters. And when we accept that identity, um, we get to live out of the fullness of the great love that he has for us. And that propels us in everything that we do. It informs us in all that we do. Because again, we aren't, we aren't, everything we do in life isn't to search for an identity, isn't search for a purpose. It's just to rest in knowing whose we are. Um, and we operate out of a place and a posture of love, which then brought us to the fourth point, which is the pressure isn't on us to perform. Because when we know that we are a child of God who is loved so deeply and fully, no matter what, it takes the pressure off of us. We get to live from being loved and not to be loved. We're not trying to earn our love or our value or our worth because we already know that we are loved and valuable and worthy. Um, and I talked about the, the example of being the paintbrush in the artist's hands. And so, again, when we look and we say, okay, this, this, these are the facets of our identity. I'm, re- I'm in that. I'm resting. That is where we're going to pick up here today in part two. Um, I mentioned at the end of part one that if you know me at all, I'm really big on application, meaning what's the next step? 
Um, so you have the information, but now what? Um, and maybe that's just me being a therapist. I don't know, but I just, I feel like you've, you've got to do something with information. Um, so that is what I intend to kind of delve into and kind of tease out is what do we do with this conversation that we've had about identity and those four points that I made last week in part one or not last week, excuse me, two weeks ago in, um, part one. And so I am going to break down, hmm, how many points do I even have? I have them lettered. So um, I've through F. <laughs> you do the math. A, B, C, D, E, F. I got six points. Um, so bear with me. But I hope that answering what you do with this now, what, I hope that it will help you take this information and create some action um, that is impactful. So number one, what do we do with this? I think we sit down. And we start taking inventory of the identity that we've placed over ourselves. Who have we said we are? Again, I asked you last um, in in part one, I said, who are you? Answer that question. And I would say, ask yourself that, right? Grab a piece of paper. I'm right at the top. Who am I? And start jotting down who we say we are. Somebody asked us that question. How do we answer that? Who have others said we are? What are the things that we've heard other people say to us? Oh, goodness, you are, you're smart. You're reliable. Oh, you're um, so-and-so's daughter. Or, oh, you're so-and-so's son. What are the identities that others have said over us? What are the identities that we carry around with us and that propel us? And so just right now, unless you're driving, (laughs) um, Take out a sheet of paper and write at the top, who am I? And just start writing down every identity that you can think of, that you have held on to, that others have said over you, so that we can take an honest inventory. Number two, next is we start looking at that list and asking what we do with it. Do we want these identities? Are they identities that we take on? Or are they just things that people have said over us? Do these identities serve us well? Are they true? Um, You know, for example, uh, if we've been told we're always second best by someone, um, do we accept that identity? Or do we need to uproot that seed that was planted and destroy it? Um, It's funny. um, I'm... I wasn't going to share this story, but I love when people share stories. So I'm going to go ahead and share it. Um, Back in high school, uh, I ran track and field. I loved running from the time I was little. Um, I was halfway decent at it. And um, I was was pretty successful. And um, I remember my coach at the time. I mean, he just, he was not involved. He, I, I did all my own workouts and trainings and, uh, I just basically was on my own. And I remember probably partway through the season, um, he came up to me and, and told me how I wasn't very fast. And I, I looked at him and said, what do you mean? And he was like, you're not fast. And I was like, but I, I win all my events. <laughs> and again, I wasn't saying that from a place of pride. It was just a, a fact, I, you know, and I really enjoyed running. Um, And I enjoyed that I was contributing to my team, right? Because in track and field, even though you do individual events, for the most part, um, your points count toward your team. um, And I was happy to to be successful for my team. And he said, no, no, you're not the fastest. And I was like, okay. So I asked him who, who he thought were the fastest. And he mentioned, and I said, well, can you can I've literally never raced against them they've never raced in any of my races how would you know that I just know I said well can you put them in a race with me so that we can kind of settle this matter (laughs) and that gives you any insight to um I'm the baby of the family I can be a little feisty um I'm very competitive um and so he did but if again if you knew anything about track um he there's heats And so he put me in the slowest heat possible, put them in the fastest heat possible. And, um, 
and to, you know, in an effort, obviously with the faster heats, you usually get the faster times and ultimately somebody from the fast heats wins. But, um, I won the race and I remember going over and saying like, does this settle it? And he said, no, that was a fluke. <laughs> and I'll tell you, um, I've kind of, I've, I've carried that around with me, um, for far too long. And, and that's not the first time ever in my life that, um, you know, I've kind of been told I'm not who I am. You know, I'm, you're not fast. Um, and again, it's kind of a silly story, but again, those things shape us, they formulate us and we take those things on. And a lot of times it's not just the obvious message of you're not fast. It's you're not believed in or you're not good enough, or nothing you do will ever be good enough, or you can never prove yourself. And so I think what we have to do in life is take that inventory so that we can kind of um, see what we've put on ourselves, what others have put on ourselves, and start filtering that out. What do we need to get rid of? What do we need to just look at and say, that's just not true? Um, and so you kind of do a spring, you start doing a spring cleaning of your, of your inventory of the things that people have said as to who you are. And then I think the third thing we got to do is with all of those things, we got to draw that umbrella. And I would encourage you, if you have that piece of paper that you wrote all those down and you're crossing out, start crossing out the identities that you refuse to believe or that do do not serve you well, or just, again, are, are false. And then what I want you to do is draw an umbrella. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a great artist, <laughs> but it's a kind of a basic shape. I want you to draw the top of an umbrella over all of those things if you can. If you need an additional sheet of paper, get an additional sheet of paper and kind of tape it. You draw an umbrella at the top of that and tape it behind um, so that basically there's an umbrella covering all of those other things listed. And I, what I want you to do is in that umbrella, I want you to write child of God. If you have accepted Christ as your savior, if you have accepted being a son or a daughter of God, then I want you to write that down. I want you to look and say, I am a child of God and it's time for me to put on that ultimate identity. We've got to pour that firm foundation of who we are, and then we can take everything else and start building our life upon that firm foundation. Loved, created, chosen child of God. And then we can start slotting in those other identities, characteristics, and pursuits. It's funny because this makes me think of the scene in Lion King. I don't know if you guys are Lion King fans out there. Um, but it makes me think of the scene in Lion King where little Simba has ventured out where he shouldn't have been and he comes across Scar's hyenas and he's kind of backed into a corner and he tries to scare off the hyenas by letting out a roar. And when he goes to let out a roar, it's a very little unintimidating roar. Wow. Um, <laughs> you're welcome for that. Um, it's just this little kind of sad roar that ultimately the hyenas just start laughing at. They're laughing at his efforts to protect himself. So then Simba kind of, you know, okay, I'm don't laugh at me. And he tries to let out another roar. And when he does, all of a sudden there's this big, powerful roar that we hear that catches everybody off guard. Sim even Simba. And the hyenas. Here it was his dad who showed up and stepped in to be his powerful protector. And so when Simba had no voice and no power, no impact, his dad stepped in to be that for him. And that is what I would encourage you. Find your power and impact in knowing we are operating through our Heavenly Father's love for us. There is such power and impact in knowing we are a child of God and every other identity falls under that. And, and that position, that identity as child of God propels us, empowers us in every other identity and every other effort. Point four, remember that your identity is always going to be attacked by the enemy of your soul. 
Satan knows that our identity and knowing who we are is more important than we even realize. If he can get us to question who we are and even start focusing on who we are, he can tempt us with greater success, right? We're distracted. We can be prideful. And like Jesus, we must cling to our, you are my son, my daughter with whom I am well pleased. Because before Satan's attempts to tempt Jesus, Satan started the attack with an attack on his identity. And so we have to realize that our identity is obviously more important than we even realize. But Satan realizes our identity is important because that is what he attacks first. And we need to realize that he doesn't do it once. He did it three times to Jesus. And I'm sure this wasn't it, but this is a story I'm referencing from the Bible. But that's what Satan does. He's relentless and he is going to use the same tactics over and over and over. Let me get you to take your eyes off of God. Let me get you to question who you are and in your distraction and then in your searching, I'm going to give you something alluring that gives you a false sense of identity and purpose and worthiness and love and ultimately is going to let you down. Point five, right? A, B, C, D, E. Yes, fifth point. Parents. Um, I know not all of you are parents that are tuning in, um, but I do think that this can be applied, honestly, to every relationship. But parents, you must bridle your tongue to make sure that you are speaking the identity of Christ over your children. I mentioned in part one how a huge part of our identity and the way that we speak to ourselves, our core beliefs about who we are come from the verbal and nonverbal communication of our attachment figures, which is typically our parents. Every once in a while, it could be a grandparent or something raising a child, but typically it's our parents. And so what you have to realize is that your voice is internalized into the core identity of who your child believes he or she is. Are you giving life and purpose or death and destruction? And your intentions can be great, right? Like you're pushing your child toward accolades and financial success and achievements and just get in the right school. Oh, just be the best athlete. And we're pushing them toward those because we feel like that's going to create success and, and purpose. But those things must be under the umbrella of knowing who they really are. Those things are given impact when placed under the umbrella of child of God. They pursue those things to be a blessing and bring glory to God. And no matter what they achieve, they are worthy of love and they are valued and they are important. You need to give them the gift of knowing that they are more than what they accomplish or achieve. They are God's children who get to steward their gifts and talents and abilities to make a difference in this world. That's what a child needs. So the things you say and the way that you communicate to them, both with your words, but also how you talk to them with your tone and your body language, it really matters and it sticks with them. And I see this every day in my work. You have a very unique opportunity to daily help that child know that they are a child of God And out of that comes such power and purpose and rest. Um, For those of you with younger children, just a little recommendation. Um, I like, there's a book, You Are Special by Max Licato. Um, And I really like that book. And I'll tell you why I like that book. Because it talks a lot about, um, it basically is the theme of, we have to go and spend time with the Lord to know who we are and have confidence in who we are as his creation. Um, so that we do not take on all of the things that other people say to us, good or bad, because it loses its power and impact when we know ultimately we are a child of God who's loved, created, and um, adored and valued. So um, again, that's called You Are Special by Max Licato. It's really a cute book. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't know exactly what age group it's for, but I mean, I think that you could read it for middle schoolers and it still be impactful. Um, So just a little recommendation for, for you parents. And then my sixth and final point is rest in your identity. 
And I know that this is so hard. This is hard for me. And every day, like I said, I have to say, you're the paintbrush. You're the paintbrush. You're not the artist. Um, But rest in your identity. Um, Ask the Lord to help you in that, to help remind you that he loves you. Because God does love you. You are loved. You were created by God for a reason. He does not make mistakes. Live in the confidence that you are cherished and there is nothing that can make your Abba Father remove his love for you. So let him pick you up as his paintbrush and start creating something beautiful through you for his glory. And that would be my, my, my thought for you with that fifth point is just try to find rest in the arms of your heavenly father who says you are loved and I'm, I'm here for you and I believe in you and you are valued Go out and make a difference. In kind of my conclusion of this two-part series, all around us, we are labeled and categorized. We're told that our identity in what we, produ- in what we produce, our background, our physical features, um, whatever other groupings um, that we're shoved into, um, often by culture or media or world, you know, you are this, you are that, you are, and, and we're, we're isolated and divided, honestly, by a lot of these identities, so to speak. And we tend to take each of these things and we put them on like clothing. And we do it from the time we're little, right? The things that are set over us shape and mold us. And it's time for us to take the inventory of who we believe we are. It's time to take out the trash, clean up those identities to put on our ultimate identity as a child of God and then live from that beloved place of safety, security, purpose, and power. Who are you? You are a child of God. Go out with the confidence of that and shine so brightly. Well, friends, this concludes this episode of the Real Talk podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad you did. Remember, you were handcrafted by God, are dearly loved, and greatly needed in this world. We look forward to seeing you back here next time. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Real Talk. To stay connected, follow Foundation Restoration on Instagram and Facebook at FND restoration or visit us at www.foundationrestoration.org for more information if you've enjoyed this podcast please make sure to follow or subscribe and to leave us a five-star review so more people can find our show foundation restoration is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry that believes marriage is the heartbeat of society and exists to equip strengthen and restore marriages through clinical expertise and a biblical perspective. Please consider supporting our ministry with a tax-deductible donation at www.foundationrestoration.org. Your gift makes programs like this possible. Thank you for your generosity and partnership.